here from Phil Valier, and Phil is a member of the research staff in the Rubenstein School. He's worked for the Park Studies Lab and the Vermont Tourism Research Center since 1994 when he completed his master's degree in natural resource planning at the University of Vermont. Phil is an author on many publications and frequently participates in national and regional meetings pre presenting research findings. And his talk will be on monitoring forest recreation. Thanks, Wes. Yeah. Yes, I work with Wes every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to recognize my co-authors, uh, primarily the second author, Nathan. Uh, the, the work that I'm talking about is something he's been spearheading, so if there are any questions I can't answer, uh, you know, track him down afterwards. Uh, also, Bob Manning, uh, who is, is trapped in D.C., trying to get back from some travel. And then uh, Jessica Savage with uh, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation has been our primary contact uh, in, the, in the second part. Oh. These slides kind of translated briefly. Okay, so um, this was actually a little picture of a hiker. Um, anyway, so uh, why, uh, why might we talk about recreation and why is recreation important? Um, primarily, we, we are motivated to recreate because we expect to receive some benefits from that recreation. Um, and, wow, these really didn't translate well at all. Um, so, uh, so what, what we do when we recreate is we, we participate in activities in various settings, and those settings um, have various components uh, to them. Right? Um, there's a resource component, a managerial component, and a social component of those settings. Um, and some, some things we might think about in each of those components, for instance, uh, if we're talking about hiking in a state park, we might be interested in receiving solitude. We take our hike and then maybe we'll reflect on it. Um, and those maybe are some of the benefits we might get. Uh, but things we might notice about the setting along the way are, uh, from the resource perspective, impacts to the trail or the vegetation along the trail. Uh, so from the managerial perspective, we might talk, think uh, we might see facilities and development. How are those trails actually laid out and, and created? And then uh, social aspects, things like trail encounters, um, can, can influence uh, our experience. Um, so there's this use, impact, quality kind of continuum. And um, if, if you think about use on the x-axis and then perhaps impact or quality on the y-axis, you see that use in general, and obviously these relationships are hypothetical, uh, very few things in nature happen in straight lines, um, but if, if usually we think of uh, with increasing use on the x-axis comes increasing impact on the y-axis. And there's an inverse relationship between that increasing impact with what, what you might think of as quality of the experience, so or the quality of the resource. Um, so we might say that increasing use might actually decrease quality. Um, and so the first question we, we, we have to ask ourselves in any kind of recreation management is, well, what's, what's going on with use? And that's kind of the monitoring that we've been, we've been working on with Jessica. Um, talk a little bit about objective-based management. Um, so, the, and fitting monitoring into this whole scheme. So we think about, when we think about management of, of, of particularly park, re, park type resources, um, management objectives, which are kind of these global, what do I expect from this piece of property? So, you know, do I expect high quality recreation? Do I expect solitude? That sort of thing. Um, but that's kind of hard to measure. How do we measure solitude? How do we know when we're getting solitude and when we're getting high quality recreation? So that we talk about coming up with indicators. So indicator, an indicator of solitude might be the number of um, encounters you, you, you have while you're on a trail in a state park sometime. Um, and then we set a standard. That is, what is the minimum acceptable condition <coughs> of that indicator? And then we monitor that to see, are we within standard or do we need, do we need to do some management to actually bring ourselves to within standards? Um, and, and this gets at that a little bit. So our, our objective kind of defines quality and desired conditions, whereas the indicator is a measurable, manageable proxy for that, that idea of, of our objectives. Um, so when we're, when we're motivated and we, we do our activity in that setting and we try to get our benefits, um, those objectives should feed right back into that. Um, you know, so if, if, our, if our objective is solitude, um, and we take our hike and our indicator for that for solitude might be number of trail encounters. Um, we want to figure out what is our minimum acceptable condition. So we look at our, we look at our hypothetical relationship and we see that uh, if we want a certain level of quality, a certain level of use follows from that with that relationship. So this is all just background to talk about um, monitoring and that's our, that's our kind of 
general model of how that looks. Uh, but what about monitoring? Uh, the work we've been doing with uh, Forest Parks and Recreation is looking at, um, often when we monitor, we use kind of labor intensive types of, uh, types of me methods like, well, trail registers aren't necessarily tr uh, terribly uh, labor intensive, but they're, they're also not terribly accurate. Uh, we know a lot of people do not fill out registers when they go on a trail. Uh, permits, fairly accurate. In other words, if you require a permit in an area, you're pretty assured of people doing that, although perhaps not everyone. Surveys often is a, is a slice in time. Uh, it's a sample, and so you're not getting everyone. And then counters, which is what we're primar uh, pr primarily going to talk about today. Um, so your registers, their basic information gets you some volume of use, perhaps the residence, group size, destinations, but it's all anecdotal. Um, it, it's self-reported. And a lot of groups exclude themselves. They just don't fill these out when they go on trails. So trail registers give you some estimate of perhaps use and so forth, but uh, perhaps not terribly reliable ones. Surveys uh, it can happen on or off site, which is a, a pro, uh, but you have to have some sort of sampling plan. And again, it's a sample. It's not a census, usually. Uh, you can get at things uh, like users, activity types, uh, what they're doing on their trip what they think about the conditions of the resource that they're in, uh, how, how they feel about management of that resource, um, and it's a way of getting some public input. Um, the challenges for doing a survey is that it's burdensome, both on the researchers and the, and the participants. Uh, again, it's self-reported, so if you're asking someone, how many people did you see today? It's kind of what they perceived they saw. It may not be actually what they saw, um, and you have to recruit these folks to do it. Now, when we're thinking about monitoring and using uh, uh, trail counters, which I'm going to get to, um, and surveys, think of trail counters as being broad in scope, but very shallow. Think of surveys as being very narrow, but very deep. So that you can get some very deep information about uh, all these types of things. But it, it's, it's, again, it's usually just a slice in time uh, of a sample of visitors. So if you combine those two types of things, uh, if you get some counter data that's maybe a little broader but shallower, uh, with some survey data you can do some fairly powerful things. Um, so counters are, are a fairly, uh, a relatively old technology these days. I mean, we've, we've all seen uh, road counters in the roads for, for many, many years. Uh, but their affordability for use in recreation settings has really, uh, the, the, the price has really come down in the last few years, uh, such that we're able to purchase, um, you know, you could have 20 or 30 counters out for a, a fairly minimal amount of money. Uh, counters can be placed in rows, parking lots, trailheads, uh, or on the trails themselves. Uh, placement is very important, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, data management uh, can be quite cumbersome because you have to go and tend to these counters, uh, download the data, bring it back to the lab, and then start really analyzing it. And calibration is exceptionally important. One thing you should understand is that counters provide an estimate of use. We think of counters as providing, oh, this is this will just get us our use, but um, it is an estimate, and I'll show you why. Uh, so some things about trail counter placement. Um, some things, constriction, close, and, and you'll see what these mean by these diagrams in a moment. Core, clarity, specificity, and concealment. Uh, so constriction, so you want to uh, capture trail counter data in a spot that kind of is a bottleneck in a trail, so where people are primarily single file. Um, you also want to have your trail counter as close to the subject as possible. And you, you notice that the trail counter beam, the, the, the ones that we primarily use, are infrared. And so that beam spreads out in a cone. And so the closer you are to the beginning of that beam is the narrower the beam, and therefore you're not going to get a situation where um, if you're far away, you might actually get two counts by the same person because they're, they're going through the beam twice uh, or they're in the beam long enough that they get, they get counted twice because there's an interval in between each count, uh, a minimum interval. So uh, constriction, keeping that the place in the trail where these, these counters are placed and then keeping them as close to the trail as possible. You also want to hit somebody in their core. You know, if you, if you have a trail counter placed too low, you might catch one leg and then the other leg, and so you're getting double counts for one person. So having it in the core, also, um, you want to have it kind of human height as opposed to perhaps animal height, um, so that you don't get false counts that way, unless you're counting animals, in which case counters may not be the, the ideal technology for that. Um, 
clarity if you have uh, things that are going to blow in front of your counters. It's, uh, it's going to make that difficult to, uh, to interpret the data. Um, also, uh, light really affects these things. So if, uh, if there's sunlight shining directly into the, into the beam, uh, that can affect your counts as well as, as plant life and so forth, giving some uh, false counts. Um, specificity. So here we see a trail network. Um, and if you're interested in how many folks might be using kind of the portion of the trail that's in green there, um, there are several places you need to place counters uh, to count access points as well as use on that individual trail. So you notice uh, we've got a, a network of trails down here that feed into that, that green section. We've also got a trail leading in up here and then a network of trails up here. So if we're interested in from here to here, we actually have to place four counters to get a really uh, good idea of use in that area. And then finally, concealment. Um, believe it or not, recreationists sometimes don't like to think that they're being watched. Um, and so concealing these things, and particularly because they, they kind of can look like a camera, even though they're not. We don't take pictures of people, we're just counting them. So concealment's important. Can anybody point to where they might see the counter in this photo? I know the photo's not a great clarity, but it's right there. Um, it's, it's a little back off the trail, uh, but that's what it looks like up close. So we've got some concealment. Um, it, it's hard to tell from this photo, but the, none of these branches are actually in the way of the counter, so they're not going to provide false, uh, false counts. Um, and then the bean spreads out, and you see that this may not be ideal placement, but it's kind of the best you can do in, in, the, in the situation. Um, and then a little bit about calibration. Calibration is really important. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, in this case, you would get an estimate of one count with people, two people uh, walking abreast, but there are actually two individuals that are being counted. Um, so that's one, one way you can see if calibration is important. Again, if you're, if you're far from the counter where the trail is, um, you might get a, a count of two when there's only one individual. So these things need to be calibrated. And the way we do that is stationing personnel to watch while we're counting. Um, and uh, we, we come up with a, uh, a relationship. It's essentially a regression uh, coefficient. Um, if, if your regression coefficient is greater than one, it means the counter is undercounting. If it's less than one, your counter is overcounting. If it's equal to one, it, you're, you're perfect, although more likely your math is wrong. Um, <laughs> there's usually some. And then uh, R-squared tells you how well your data fit, your, your count data by your people fits your, uh, fits your count. I don't have any real data. Um, we're, we're still in the process of calibrating and, and dealing with the data, but this is to some ideas about how you might use this technology uh, to, at, at a low-cost way to actually monitor uh, use on, on recreation trails and so forth. Questions, comments? I have a couple minutes of that. Yeah, a couple minutes. Um, is there, I'm thinking about multiple use on trails. Is, is there anything like, that we could look to in the future that would help kind of look at multiple use on trails. Sure, so um, there are some trail counters, the ones that I mentioned here are infrared, there are also ones that use um, magnetic um, conduction, and so and they can be sensitive enough to pick up like mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you ride a mountain bike over this, this conductor pad, um, it will pick that up as a, as, a, okay. as a mountain bike, but if you step over it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna trip it. So there are ways to, with multiple types of counters, to perhaps do that. Um, I've also, I'm also aware of some studies that actually do use photography. Um, it's, it's a little dubious. A lot of managers get really nervous about doing that because they're then taking surreptitious pictures of users, but that's one way of getting at it as well. Um, how effective are the trail monitors uh, for monitoring winter use and winter time? Uh, they're, they're fine. Um, they can be out in the weather. They're, they're water, water and uh, uh, weather resistant. Um, they do need to be tended um, because the data need to be downloaded, uh, they're, they're battery operated, so they need to, the batteries need to be checked periodically. I would imagine battery life in the wintertime would be a little less than in the summertime, uh, but they are, you can use them in the wintertime. One more question? Yeah, I have a question. Very much.